Reggie White was one of the most awarded players in NFL history. As a defensive end, he was arguably the greatest pass rusher of all time. Now, J.J. Watt, a more recent defensive end who was once called the NFL's best player, talked in an interview last year about how he still studies footage of Reggie White's performances on the field, hoping to pick up a thing or two. Now, if you know anything about Reggie White, uh, if you're a football fan or a Reggie White fan, you know that not only was he one of the best to ever play the game, but that he was a very outspoken Christian. His boldness for Jesus earned him the nickname, the Minister of Defense. I like that. That's great. After his untimely death, one author wrote this, perhaps no professional athlete had evangelized more often or more publicly than Reggie White. And his story is a remarkable one. It it can teach us, it can inspire us. It's a great story. Now in our text tonight, we're gonna read about another man who is remembered for both his faith and his vocation. He's a man whose experience paved the way for Reggie White to get saved and for you to get saved and for me to get saved. In fact, our passage this evening chronicles a pivotal moment in the story of the church and really an absolute turning point in human history. As the gospel is now made equally and officially and fully available to the Gentile world. Now, I'm guessing all of us or almost all of us are Gentiles here tonight. And uh, we've had thousands of years of the gospel being preached to us. And so It's almost impossible for us not to take for granted uh, that we get to receive the gospel too. But this was by no means in the minds of the first century church, or at least the first church in Jerusalem, by no means a foregone conclusion or even a plan in their own hearts and minds. And so this is a big, big turning point, one that directly impacts not just your life uh, and not just your eternity, but really the turning of the whole world when we think about what the church through the Gentile world has accomplished in 2,000 years of human history. Now, Acts chapter 10 is somewhere around eight to 10 years after Pentecost. It's not always easy to nail down when exactly these uh, events take place, but we're probably a decade in to the life of the church. Up until now, the entire church is Jewish. They're all Jews that have converted to Christianity. There was probably an exception or two. Of course, we know there was at least one exception, right? The Ethiopian eunuch. He wasn't born a Hebrew. And I'm sure there were a few others who came into contact with Jewish Christians and had the gospel preached to them like the eunuch did and had become born again. Although some Bible scholars will argue that even then, all of those may have been Jewish proselytes first. We're not sure. But now we're at a point where something very dramatic and unexpected had happened. The gospel had been received in Samaria. Now, these half-Jewish ancient kinsmen of Israel were getting saved. And it's unexpected. It's surprising. But what about the great Gentile world, everybody else outside of Israel? So far, there had been no apostolic preaching to non-Jews. Even when the Ethiopian eunuch was saved, it hadn't been an official invitation or some sort of rally or some sort of crusade sent. Uh, It was a spur of the moment divine appointment, right? And we studied that when it happened. It's clear from the rest of Acts and things that we read in the epistles later in the New Testament that there was no assumption among the church at this point that God's offer of salvation was going to go out to the Gentile world. In fact, For years, some church leaders and many Jewish Christians resisted the idea that the gospel was going to be preached to the Gentiles. At the very least, many thought that Gentiles would first have to convert to Judaism, and then they would be able to receive Jesus Christ and be saved. This is a battle the Apostle Paul would have to fight again and again and again and again and again from brothers within the church. But Acts 10 shows what God had in mind. He makes it plain and clear that the gospel was for everyone equally. And the way that he does so is bold and striking as we see a man named Cornelius coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's a significant event that Luke gives a lot of attention to comparatively in this book. And through this work, God makes some strong statements both to the unbelieving world and to all of the Jewish Christians which comprised the church at the time. 
Most of you are familiar with this story already and you know what a remarkable man Cornelius was. We'll see he was a man of great integrity, of deep religious conviction. He was a man of generosity and humility. He was a man with a missionary mindset. He was a man who was seeking after God. And the truth is, when Bible scholars and commentators examine his example here, they find themselves in disagreement over when exactly Cornelius was regenerated. It's not necessarily a bad question to ask, but rather than debate that, I would like us to step back and take a look at something else from his example. And that's this, when we read his example, People can argue about the moment of his regeneration, right? Or at which moment when he died, would he have gone to heaven? That's something we just can't really know. And there's lots of arguments back and forth, one reason or another. Uh, Rather than really debate that, when we take a look from a wider angle at his example, what do we see? We see a man who God was pleased with, a man that God uh, was excited about his life. God was pleased with his heart and his behavior. We will be told outright by an angel from heaven that God heard this man's prayers. He responded to his efforts. He was excited about the life Cornelius was living. Now, I would tend to agree that Cornelius wasn't yet born again in the New Testament sense in verses one through eight. But as born again Christians tonight, wouldn't we say that we want to please God, that we want our prayers to be heard, that we want the Lord to reveal more of himself as we seek him? Uh, heaven describes Cornelius as a devout man. And, and, and that's the Holy Spirit's assessment of him, even in verse one. And we have to keep in mind that this was a huge time of transition in the way that God dealt with people. This time between the the cross, the resurrection and the establishing of the church, the gospel going out first to Israel, then Samaria and, and to the Gentiles. It's not that anyone was saved any different. Everyone has always been saved the same way, by grace, through faith, right? But obviously, when we look at the Bible, we see that there, the, the content of a person's faith is different at different times, right? Abraham didn't believe in Jesus Christ. He didn't know that name. He didn't know the plan of God through salvation, but he believed in what had been revealed to him, right? And it was accounted to him as righteousness. And so one of the things we want to think about is how this is a great time of transition. Cornelius is saved according to the same rules that everyone else is saved by grace through faith. But as we look at him and we see his story, we see that on this side of him receiving the Holy Spirit, he looks a lot like an Old Testament believer. He's praying to God, he's worshiping God, he's honoring God, and God is pleased with what he sees. And so when we look at him as an example, as people who we have been evangelized, we are saved, we have received the Holy Spirit, okay, well, now I wanna look at his life and say, man, I wanna have a life that pleases God. I wanna be uh, the kind of man or the kind of person that, that, knows my prayers are being heard and responded to that is pleasing the Lord with the aroma of my spiritual offering. And so we want those things to be true of us too. Now we Gentiles who have the additional benefits of the completed word of God, the lessons of church history and the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can be encouraged in our own devotion to the Lord and meditate on the kind of life that pleases God So begin in verse one, there we read this. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. The opening phrase of this pivotal event is important, I think. There was a man, a certain man, a particular individual and his family were the targets of God's work that day. I say that because the way we do things today, I don't mean we as our local church, but the way that we in our sort of Western culture do things today is that we target a region and we set up a church or a ministry there. We hang out a shingle and then say, we've begun the ministry, right? And the metric you hear all the time, all the time, all the time is, okay, this city or this region has this X percentage of unchurched people. And so we are establishing a church or we're establishing a ministry or we're gonna plant here. I don't know why it's always Southern California where everything's nice, (laughs) but whatever, okay? And so the reasoning is, hey, there is unchurched people in this fancy part of Southern California. (laughs) 
and so God must want to establish something in this city. And you know what? Maybe that's true. I'm not poo-pooing all of that. Paul, we know, had specific regions that he wanted to go to sometimes, like Asia, like Spain. Interestingly, when he said, I want to go to Asia, God said, no, no, you can't go to Asia in general, right? But it's possible that God can work in that sense. But what do we see much more often in the Bible? We see God connecting individuals to other individuals, A good recent example from the book of Acts is this. Philip wasn't sent to Ethiopia. He was sent to an Ethiopian, right? And then that guy goes home and ministers to his coworkers and his family and his community. And we see from church history that the Lord did a great work through him. Even in Paul's ministry, churches were established after people got saved somewhere. Paul didn't go and say, I have established a church here Now we need to find some people to attend this church. That didn't happen. Paul would go to a place and maybe he was thinking, I want to go to this city in particular or this region in particular. But when he went there, he said, now I need to talk to individuals and preach to them. And when they got saved, he established a church there, right? Now, had God wanted to be strategic about reaching the Gentile world the way we are often trying to be strategic in our own thinking, he would have launched the Gentile outreach in China. Some scholars estimate that China contained 20% of the world's total population at that time. Or at very least, God would have gone to Rome, the most important city in the whole world, certainly in the Gentile world but the Lord was more interested in a particular person and the people around him than in a particular place. That person was a soldier named Cornelius, not just a soldier, but a centurion in command of others, probably a hundred other guys. Not just any centurion, he was uh, in an elite squad known as the Italian Regiment. And you know, I think God is making a big statement here. He was starting this new work in the Gentile world in a blatant, unapologetic way. Cornelius is the poster boy, literally, for Rome. When you think of a Roman, what's the image that comes to your mind? It's Cornelius in his regalia, the gold hat with the red feathers, right? That's what you think of so often. He's the poster boy for Rome, an Italian soldier tasked with protecting the governor in Caesarea, as in the land of Caesar, right? He's just not, not just a member of the empire. He's the strong arm of the empire. If you wanted to get as far away from a Jew as possible, this guy is definitely in the running. And that's who the Lord was going to publicly display as the very first Gentile member of his church. Now, this should encourage us in a variety of ways. First, the rem- reminder that anyone can get saved. Anybody, 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 anybody. You know, I wonder if Simon the Zealot, the apostle, thought that a Roman centurion of the Italian regiment was going to be the first Gentile member of the church, if there was ever going to be such a thing. We talked about this when we studied the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar can get saved. The worst man in the whole world. The apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he's the worst person in the whole world at this time. He hates Jesus Christ more than anyone. And the gospel shows us, or the gospel is strong enough that anyone can get saved if they will turn to the Lord. And so that's an exciting thought. But second, you know, the gospel plays offense, not just defense. Sometimes we feel like we're always on the defensive and this is coming against us and that's coming against us and and, and we're trying to keep our balance out in the culture around us. But you know, the gospel plays defense or offense sometimes, goes out there and says, "Go, go talk to that guy. Let's go find us a centurion and tell him that Jesus loves him and that he died for his sins. And then third, we should just ask for the kind of boldness that God demonstrates here. And that's something that the apostles and the Christians did all the time in this book. They're asking for boldness. Lord, give us boldness. And we see that we serve a bold God who's ready uh, to go out and do some great work. Now, Cornelius's career was impressive, but it's who he was as a person that put him on God's radar. Verse two says, he was a devout man. He feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. As we get into his religious life here, let's remind ourselves that Cornelius did not earn salvation. He didn't buy God's favor with good works. That's never how it works with the Lord. 
Cornelius, like all people, was saved by grace through faith. But we see that he, that Lord was pleased with Cornelius. And in this verse, we're given a lot of description about his spiritual life. There was a lot of motion in his devotion. In fact, people who know things about language that I don't know will point out that there are a couple of different terms that Luke could have used for the word devout. Uh, and the one that he used is a particular one that doesn't direct our thoughts towards, well, in his mind, he had personal religious piety, that kind of devotion. The word he used, according to Vine's Dictionary of the New Testament, points out that the term means, it conveys a sense of energy and activity. It wasn't just a mindset, but that Cornelius directed active expressions of his faith toward God. And so his devotion was not just academic. It wasn't just intellectual. It wasn't just a frame of mind. It was a devotion that had motion to it. It had energy. It had action. We learn here that he was a man of prayer, a man of spiritual action. He shared his faith with his family and his household staff. We'll see he also influenced the soldiers in his command. He was generous. He was sacrificial. He had a vibrant, active spiritual life at home, on the field, and everywhere in between. Now, categorically, he would have been known uh, as a God-fearer. That was a class of people according to uh, the Jewish religion. You had Jews and you had proselytes, people who weren't Jewish but had converted to Judaism through all the rites and rituals. If you were a man, you had to be circumcised. And then there was another classification, God-fearers, and this is what Cornelius was. Uh, he was a Gentile who believed in the God of the Old Testament, even attended synagogue, but had not become a circumcised proselyte. And therefore, even though he was in mental agreement with the teachings of Israel, he would have been considered ceremonially unclean and restricted from the bulk of worship, right? Now, despite being held at arm's length by the Jews and the Jewish system around him, and despite being undoubtedly hated by many Jews as an enforcer of the Roman occupation, Cornelius, we see, still engaged with the community of God's people. He still prayed to the God of Israel. He still sought God day in and day out. He didn't know Jesus yet, and the Lord was going to take care of that. But during this time of great transition in God's dealings with man, Cornelius serves as a wonderful example of a vibrant, God-pleasing faith in the Old Testament sense. He's also a wonderful example of the truth revealed in Scripture that if a person will respond to the light that they've been given... God will make a way that they receive more light. How does he do that? We don't always know. But one of the questions that is, uh, crops up in our own hearts or is lobbed at Christians from time to time is what about those who have never heard? What about the tribesmen that, you know, who has never heard the name of Jesus, has never heard the gospel? It's an honest question. It's even a fair question. And what we can be sure of from the teaching of scripture, from examples like Cornelius, from many countless stories throughout church history, and from direct you know, verses from the Bible is that when a person responds to the light that they've been given, that God will find a way that they receive more light, more revelation. We can't always know how that works and the nuts and bolts of that, but we can trust God, Right? And we know that he is trustworthy. And we know that God has scattered people all throughout time and all over the world so that they will grope after him. And we know that God has placed eternity in the hearts of every man, woman, and child so that they will seek after him. And when people say, yeah, I wanna seek after this God who has revealed himself in creation, this God who is speaking to me in my heart through the conviction of sin and all these other things, then the Lord responds. He is faithful to respond. And outright, the Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. That's what God says. And the truth is the tribesmen who's never heard the gospel, they're no farther off than an Ethiopian eunuch. They're no farther off than a Roman centurion. They're no farther off than Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when all of those people found truth in the Lord. And so the Bible promises, seek and you will find, and Cornelius is a sterling example of that truth. Verse three says, about three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius, one thing we should notice throughout the whole situation is the amount of clarity experienced even in these visions. He saw distinctly. He will be given clear directions. 
The same is true of Peter's vision, which hopefully we'll get to next time. Why does that matter? Well, it seems to be more and more popular for people and groups and churches to make claims about visions or supernatural manifestations. Maybe it's just as prominent as it's always been. Maybe it's just that social media helps these things spread more quickly. But it seems like there are more and more claims that of people who claim they've been to heaven, claim they've seen the face of God, claim they've seen an angel, and therefore, here's what God has said through me. Please like and subscribe, right? And so, and frequently, when you listen to these claims, there's just an abundance of fog in them. There's a complete lack of clarity. For example, Paula White, she's a, that's a name you've probably heard. She's an author and a peddler of the prosperity gospel. She's said to be the spiritual advisor and personal pastor to our president. She considers herself an apostle. Recently, she claimed to have seen the face of God in the throne room of God. But she says she couldn't see it clearly because of mist. Oh, the one thing she could see clearly was the golden mantle that was placed on her. And so naturally, we should probably listen to her and donate to her ministry and all of those sorts of things. Now listen, there are a lot of biblical problems with her claims, mostly that they're unbiblical. But there's just a lot of problems with her claims. But you know, she's not just the only one. There's lots of groups and people and ministries and books that all make similar claims about supernatural visions, encounters with angels, encounters with God the Father, encounters with Jesus Christ. When you hear these things, evaluate them. Man, Paul's been saying this for thousands of years. He says, you know, if, an, if me or anybody else or an angel from God comes down and says something to you that's contrary to what the word of God reveals, that person, me or anyone else or an angel should be accursed, Paul says. And so when you hear these things or when you're on your Facebook and a friend says, you have to watch this video. They were in the throne room of God. Evaluate them. Take a look at them. Pay attention to the details. Do they align with the teaching of scripture? An encounter like this one between Cornelius and the angel can help serve as a measuring tool for when others make claims to have heard from God. Now, we remember that Jesus appeared to Saul in a vision, right? When Saul needed a visit from heaven, who visited him? Jesus Christ, the risen Christ. He says, yeah, me, man, I'm the one you are persecuting. That's a big deal. So why not here? If it's so important to reach the Gentile world, why did they send an angel? Why didn't Jesus appear to Cornelius the way he had appeared to Saul? Well, there are two sides to the God's work in this situation. On the one side, his desire was, of course, that Cornelius and his family would be saved. On the other side, his desire is to show the Jewish Christians that Gentiles had full and equal access to salvation and the church, not by first jumping through the hoop of conversion to Judaism and the Mosaic law, but through faith in Christ. There would be no difference, no exclusion, no prequalifications necessary. If the church had any hope for unity, it would have to be clear and evident that God was reaching out to the Gentile world in the same way that he was reaching out to Israel. And so the Lord sets up a situation where all of this is gonna have to come together as Peter, the Jewish apostle, comes to the home of Cornelius, the Gentile believer, and it all has to happen in an evident, clear, undeniable way, and that's exactly what's going to happen. And toward that end, we can see a dramatic statement being made to the Jewish believers. It was, yes, even a Roman centurion can be saved. Even he can have the forgiveness of sins and the exact same filling of the spirit that you received. That's a big statement. We live in a kinder, gentler world today. At least our corner of the world is a lot kinder and gentler than first century Judea was, occupied by Rome, right? Right? Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody we knew, uh, know has been murdered by stoning out in the courtyard, right? Because they professed faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't have a foreign government that can come in and say, everything you have is mine. You disagree, well, then we're gonna kill you, right? And so you had such a rift and a divide between the Jewish people and the Gentile people incredible prejudice on both sides, just a huge gap. And the Lord needs to have a unified church. He says, no, my church is, we're gonna make them one. 
And so he's working out a situation so that it's going to be abundantly clear with no room for argument that God is doing the same thing for the Gentiles that he had done through the apostles and for the Jewish people. Very important. Verse four says this, looking intently at him, he became afraid and said, what is it, Lord? Let's pause there. I'd say this serves as another marker or measuring tool for us when people make claims about seeing angels or going to heaven. Uh, So often when I hear these claims or when you see video clips of them, it's like, oh, I was in the presence of God the Father and it was super exciting. And he said, here's gold for you and those sorts of things. You know, man alive, when anybody got in the presence of an angel in the Bible, it was like they were gonna just come apart, right? Now, here's a good example of that. Think of a centurion. Think of a battle-hardened warrior of Rome, special forces. He's the guy. Man, this guy had seen some things. He had done some things. He wasn't afraid of anybody. If you've watched uh, any of The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus. One of the great things is that anywhere the Mandalorian goes, he's not afraid of anybody. It doesn't matter how many heads you have, how tall you are, what kind of weapons you have. He walks in and is unfazed. That's Cornelius, the centurion of the Italian regiment. And what does it say about him? Man, in the presence of this kind of power, even he was terrified. Now, to his credit, he didn't turn and run. He was a courageous man. He faced the angel marshaled his emotions and he waited for instructions. Verse four continues. The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have come up as a memorial offering before God. What an amazing thing to be told. Try to imagine what has just been said. There on the altar of heaven as incense rises before the Lord, pleasing God, a wisp there comes off and is somehow identified as belonging that wisp belongs to Cornelius the centurion. There is his prayer. There is his act of compassion for one of the Jews in town. There is his kindness. There is his generosity. Look at it rise off of the altar. Those things accomplished on earth are seen as a memorial offering in heaven and categorized to his account. That's pretty exciting. We live in the dispensation of grace, but that doesn't mean that we're done with offerings. We're done with animal sacrifices for atonement, right? We don't have to go and make offerings for our own atonement. Jesus Christ took care of that once and for all at the cross. But by no means are we done with offerings. In fact, the New Testament talks to us a lot about offerings that we are expected and privileged to make to the Lord. A lot, lot, lot of them ongoing offerings that we might honor God and please him and glorify him through the actions of our lives. Here are some New Testament references for us as God's people. Hebrews 13, 15, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. Second Corinthians eight nineteen. Titus was appointed by the churches to accompany us as we take the offering to Jerusalem, a service that glorifies the Lord. Philippians 2, 17, I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. Philippians 4, 18. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Romans 12, one, of course. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. And so what we find is that we are to be people who are continually putting offerings on the altar of heaven through our devotion on the earth. A, A devotion that actually moves, that actually acts, that actually has motion to it. Cornelius was told that these things were memorial offerings. That would stand out if you were a Jewish reader. The memorial offering detailed in the Levitical code was always a representative portion. He said, hey, you had a crop of grain, bring a memorial offering. And what that is, is you have your whole crop and you take a scoop out of that. And that memorial offering is a representative portion. It was given in acknowledgement that all the crop belonged to God. 
And so when we see these ideas brought together with the imperatives in the New Testament given toward us, we find that all of our praise and all of our words and all of our money and all of our service and all of our lives belong to God. And therefore, we can regularly, joyfully give portion after portion to the Lord that he might be pleased and glorified as we do it. And that in heaven, when you offer that offering of praise, of generosity, of service, of kindness to others, when you do those things like we read in that list, it is somehow converted into sweet smelling incense on the altar of heaven. Now the angel continues on verse five. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. I think we can see God's grace here. He didn't demand that Cornelius go AWOL. He didn't say you go down. Undoubtedly, Cornelius was not allowed to leave. He had a post and centurions were expected to die at their post. One of the ancient writers talks about how, hey, these were guys that were selected who were ready to die at their post. And rather the Lord didn't say, well, forget that. He says, no, okay, you can't leave. Go send some guys and call for Peter and bring him back. And he's gonna tell you what you need to do. And this messenger named Simon Peter would come and tell them what they needed to do to be saved. You see, God didn't only want to save the impressive head of the house. He wanted to save them all down to the lowliest house servant. He said, man, I wanna save all you guys, every last one of you, and then countless more after you. Verse six says, he's lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. The encounter ends with clear direction. He's given all the information he needs to find who he's looking for. Of course, there's no GPS, no addresses, no find my friends. But you know what? God can get a lot done without modern conveniences. That's really stupid to say, uh, but I think it's a good reminder since we rely so much on our modern conveniences and our technology. It's a good reminder to remember that God does not rely on those things. Again, sometimes the church tends to slip into a mentality that we have to have certain things in order before we can accomplish ministry. A common pattern that we see these days is that when a new church plant is going to be established, their website will say this, and this happens a lot. It will say, we need $250,000 in order to get started. Even this week, uh, I was on a church's website. It's a fine church. I've got nothing against them, but they've got a fundraising campaign going, they, going and they, it says on that site, they want 100% of their people to be a part of pledging toward a three-year, $3.5 million goal. And this isn't like a, a weird, crazy televangelist church. This is a normal church, one that you would probably go to if you lived in that state and in that town, right? And they want everybody to pledge toward a $3.5 million goal. And here's what it says on the side. Build to Reach is a three-year campaign to raise funds to build a dedicated sanctuary for the church that will seat many more people and allow us to reach more souls for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, I know what they mean and I'm sure they mean well. And it's not wrong to build a bigger sanctuary, but you don't actually have to spend $3.5 million in order to reach more souls for Jesus Christ. And we wanna be careful that we don't slip into a mentality that says, well, if I don't have enough of this modern thing or this entertaining thing or this sort of facility or this sort of convenience, then people don't wanna hear the gospel. We don't wanna have that kind of mentality because God could get it done in the first century without programs or gimmicks or PayPal or anything like that. Look what God was able to do through the whole world through a few barely literate fishermen. They didn't have iPads. Love my iPad. Peter didn't have an iPad. He did just fine. So good reminder. Verse seven, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household slaves and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Cornelius was quick to obey. It's a very important part of devotion that pleases God. Though it was late in the day with little sunlight left, he sent his servants on the long 35 mile trip to Joppa. But being a man of care and concern, he made sure to send them with protection, sent them with a soldier, packing heat, no doubt. He couldn't go himself, but he fully outfitted them to get where they needed to go. And he was willing to sacrifice his own comfort for the sake of the Lord. He sent his personal attendant to help some household slaves rather than keep his personal attendant back at the house. That's a great moment. 
And we see that Cornelius was an open man. He explained everything to them. He didn't lord over these guys. He didn't pretend to be better than these guys. It may have been his station even to do so, but he didn't act like he was some special mystical religious person. I'm the man that God has spoken to. He just says, hey, come here. I want to tell you what just, went, what just happened. And he shares with them as if they are peers. Because as far as his religious life was concerned, they were peers. He's very humble, very helpful. His devotion is an inspiration to us. And he doesn't even have the Holy Spirit yet. Just imagine what Cornelius was like after verse 46. Luke doesn't follow him. But can you imagine the kind of damage this guy could have done after verse 46? We don't have to just imagine it. We get to live it out. You're Cornelius now. Remember that old Tom Hanks movie? I'm the captain now. You're the centurion now. Okay, like that's you. You don't have to imagine it. We're the Gentiles on the field now. We're the ones to whom Cornelius has handed the baton of faith. J.J. Watt, that football player who talked about studying Reggie White's play style, admits he's been unable to copy one of White's signature moves. He says, I've tried and I tried. I just can't do it. Of course, that's okay because... J.J. Watt isn't Reggie White. He's not supposed to just copy him. He became a great player in his own right while learning from guys before him. Now, we're not to copy either. We don't please God by trying to copy what Cornelius did. That's not gonna work. But we can learn from him about the motion of devotion, about living out our faith in a way that is pleasing to the Lord as we personally seek him and obey him and offer portion after portion in whatever ways we can onto the altar of heaven. A portion of praise, a portion of prayer, a portion of service, a portion of charity, a portion of generosity. I'll close with this quote. Reggie White once said this, I've always believed since I was a kid that God was gonna allow me to play professional football, to use it as a platform to proclaim and live out the name of Jesus. And you know, that's the most exciting part about my life because God has done things in me to change my character to benefit the kingdom. And so in a sense, he was just a great modern day Cornelius, but one who had been born again already. We can be too as we live life to proclaim Jesus to the world around us.